I discovered inner peace at the age of 24. Don't believe me? Let me tell you a story, okay? When I was a kid, I was a bit of a miserable kid, right? I found this picture when I was trawling through some old photos of mine, and it's a bit funny to me, because <laughs> this is a particularly sad face of mine that I'm putting right here, and I want to make this clear, right? I wasn't sad all the time. I'm not trying to paint a miserable picture of my childhood. I'm not trying to paint a sob story and say, oh, oh, woe is me, how bad was my childhood? I was quite happy sometimes, right? But I was particularly sensitive to the world around me, right? I was extremely affected by things going on, by like, you know, people around me behaving in certain ways. And I was maybe quite sensitive, right? But maybe I was just a child and children are just like that, right? That's a question in my mind that I still ask myself today. Was I just sensitive or was I just, you know, being a child, right? And so common symptoms of mine included... I was no stranger to these, right? Depression, stress, nightmares. And these are pretty common, you know, things. You might expect nightmares to be like a downstream effect of depression or stress and things like that because, you know, it kind of takes over your subconscious thought where you're thinking about these things all the time and you're stressed out over it and you're anxious over it. But sleepwalking and sleepwalking too, if you didn't know, very highly correlated with stress and anxiety and things like this. It tends to be that the people that sleepwalk and sleep talk all the time have these kind of symptoms, right? And I did this a lot when I was a kid. I didn't know what it meant, but later on in life, I was like, oh, that meant I was pretty stressed out in life. I meant that I reacted to the world in a certain way that was very internalizing and very like, there was a chaos in my mind and a very kind of, I didn't like the way that I was living. Clearly there was some kind of stress involved in my childhood in that way, right? But that all changed, right? And I'll tell you that in the story that I'm gonna tell, right? But anyway, I was very highly strung, very easily irritated, and for a brother of mine, he found this very entertaining, right? And not a sob story, okay? I promise you, this is not me trying to say, woe is me here. True evil is found in five worlds, okay? We were just kids at the time, right? And I don't blame anyone at that period of time in my life for anything that they did, because, you know, we were just kids, right? And older brothers can be that kind of way sometimes, right? And so we had the same room, and... That for me was like, oh, I didn't like that at all. I had my things. I liked to keep my things in a certain way. I had a very OCD nature. And so I was easy to annoy. And I hated that, right? We were in the same room, like a, maybe a foot apart in our beds, right? And my stuff would be maybe around my bed here. And his stuff would be around his bed here. Whatever the setup was. And I didn't like that. I was like, oh, I don't like people like seeing my things and being able to like touch my things. I was very, very like an OCD natured kind of kid, right? I was a weird kid. And so I was very easy to annoy, very highly strong, very like pre-stressed in a certain way, right? You know, like metals can be pre-stressed. I was a human being that was pre-stressed and that was how I kind of lived life. It was kind of annoying to me, right? And so that character in my life, you know how to push my buttons in the exact right way. And I would very easily become angry and emotional and stressful about this kind of lifestyle that I was living, right? He knew what to say and what to do to like, make me riled up and we get into like physical altercations right like very much i remember like the feeling of like genuinely wanting to hurt the other person like maybe you might get into a fight now when you're an adult but you'll pull your punches and you won't really get into a full physical fight but when you're kids you remember that stuff it was like i want to hurt you like, you want to bring hurt to the other person as much as you can and so that was that kind of dynamic between me and my brother right it was very kind of like he had that kind of you know he, he grew up before me and he knew like, oh, he knew how to like tease me in certain ways. And that's the kind of average dynamic you have between an older brother and a younger brother sometimes. And that's, I have no kind of sadness about that. And that's part of the, this philosophy I'm going to teach you about today, because someone might be very sad about that. Someone might look back at their past and think, oh, my life is so hard. It was so terrible. But I look back and laugh at that. It was genuinely like, a, oh, that happened. Isn't that funny? Right. I don't really have any kind of ill feeling towards people back then or anything like that i've let it all go right and that's part of the story of how i kind of came to a place where inner peace might be something that i can describe my spirit as right and so i had some other things my my fair share of like unfortunate events in my life some bad teachers some bullies at school and a general lack of friends i was quite a loner at school i found it hard to make friends and kind of socialize with people. I was kind of awkward and socially kind of inept in a certain way. And it took me a while to grow up in that kind of area of life where I eventually came to a point where I am now where I'm completely secure about that, right? 
And in general, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I hated my life, right? It wasn't a very pleasant experience for me. I used, I used to think in that way. I used to think genuinely, and this is embarrassing to admit to me, for myself, that, you know, woe is me, my life is hard, and this is my sad story, right? And I even remember this little icon here as a journal, right? My first memories of journaling were of me writing these kind of like essays or like kind of like diary entries of saying like, this is how bad my life is. I'm writing like, you know, event A, event B, event C. And I would say and describe in this like kind of story like way of like how, you know, my mum did something annoying. My brother did something annoying. And it's embarrassing for me to admit now, but I honestly, I wish I could re go back and read those because at a certain point in my childhood, I decided to delete them because I was so embarrassed and I was so mortified that anyone would ever discover them that I just deleted them all. And so I wish I actually kept them and known how I felt back in those days. And that would have been a, a nice time capsule to back, back to where my mind was at that age. But continuing on, one day it all changed, right? I don't know what it was, but at some point in my childhood, which is quite strange when you're, when you're gonna hear what I'm gonna say right now, I had a mind shift, right? That people normally have in their adulthood, right? I just realized, oh, I'm in control here, right? I don't need to react to what people do to me. I don't need to like, you know, have this overreaction or have this kind of stressful and anxious response. I can be kind of chill about life, right? I don't need to be sensitive in that way, right? Whatever that means to you. When people would you'd like poke me and like life would happen in certain ways, I didn't need to react like this, like the victim. I didn't re need to react like a sad character in a movie, right? I could just be like, oh, well, like, <laughs> that's what it is, right? Like, I need to kind of have that resilience and that kind of, like, energy of this is fine. Like, that's not a big deal, right? And have more of that energy than, oh, goodness, woe is me, and, like, how sad is my life? And ruminating in that sadness, I could just be like, oh, it's fine. Right. And so I've gotten better and better at that as I've grown up since childhood. And so today I want to tell you about that journey. Right. This is just where the journey begins. Right. And so I learned many things across that time period from when I was around about 10 years old. I don't know when exactly I had this kind of, you know, epiphany of a thought that I could change the way I can react emotionally and change my mind to live in inner peace. But over the course of 14 years, until I'm my age right now at 24, I learned different things, right? Maybe something here, A, B, C, D. And like, there was a lot of different things I learned across that time period that I want to give to you today, right? So long story short, I've mastered some kind of level of inner peace. This is Uguay from the Kung Fu Panda movie. And he's kind of like my representation of what inner peace looks like in a character that we might know of, right? And life is still hard, right? It's not as if life was easier than when I was a kid. In fact, you could say that it's always getting harder as you grow up, right? Kid and children, like maybe their lives are generally easier, right? In my opinion, I think that kids have kid-sized problems and adults have adult-sized problems. That's how I look at it. But life is still hard. That's the general message here. And I've still mastered some kind of level of peace within me right? And I'm like, genuinely, if I look around me, I feel like I'm generally happier than the average person, than the people that I hang around. And I want to pass that on to you today because I don't, I don't want to keep it for myself. I want to pass that on. Right? I want to give it to other people, right? And so for me, the world changed at that point, right? When I observed the world around me, it seemed like all the adults around me were acting like kids, right? These people didn't have any emotional control. These people weren't very well behaved. They weren't really conscious of how they looked from the outside, how they behaved and how that affected other people in their lives. Like they weren't really conscious of that. And so the world looked like to me that some of these adults haven't really grown up yet. Because at that point in time, I felt like I grew up, right? I was like, oh, this is what growing up feels like, right? Being in control of your emotions and kind of having an awareness of how you are to the world and how much resilience you can have to stuff coming into you, right? Bad events, stress, anxiety, things like this. 
I feel like I'd, I'd grown up. I was like, oh, okay. I was such like a kid before, but now I've grown up and now I'm mature. But still people around me, adults, 30s, 40s, 50s, still acting in this kind of childish way, right? A few examples of that, anger, a very classic example. Like you don't just see this in kids, right? It's a typical kid response though, isn't it? Like a temper tantrum. You might see a toddler throwing a tantrum like this, but adults do this too. When they, they throw things like mugs and break things like this, right? I've had people in my life, even growing up when I was a kid, it was, it was quite scary, right? People like this seemed like a monster to me, which, I've got, which is why I've got this little monster in the corner right here. And it's, it's kind of scary, it's kind of dangerous. And that's the effect that these people have on other people. And for me, I kind of observed that and thought, I don't want to ever be like that, right? And I kind of wondered why, like why are these people, haven't, why haven't they grown up? That's a bit strange to me, right? It was confusing to me. And to some level, it even annoyed me, right? And other people in my life, maybe this might be the opposite end of the spectrum. They have this kind of anxious response, right? Maybe they would uh, be very ready to cry, right? Like at any small little thing, they would start crying and like ruminating about things and getting anxious. And particularly people close to me in life who I'd like been close with and, you know, traveling and things like this, where this kind of emotion really, really gets <laughs> under your skin, right? It gets very annoying, but it gets very inconvenient. And at points in my life, I honestly felt like this was kind of annoying, right? That might seem rude, that might seem selfish for me to admit that, but if I'm honest with how I felt, I felt like mm, these people, like I've done the work, I've worked on my emotions, I've, I've kind of like worked on this and used these techniques to like better myself and upgrade myself. Why can't other people do this? I don't really get it, right? So that's why I felt it, it was kind of annoying. I felt, I felt that it was obvious. But perhaps to other people, they don't see that kind of self-improvement mindset. And so maybe it wasn't so obvious to them, right? So I thought in my life, okay, maybe there's other people like me. There should be some people like me. Some people should have thought in some way like that. And they might be rare. They might be few and far between. They might be like a unicorn, right? I know that this movie, that Pegasus isn't technically a unicorn, but that's the first animal I thought of. And so here's a little bit of a memory from our childhoods of a unicorn-like character, right? So I was determined to find that, right? And people in my life have told me like, okay, if you're searching for someone like this, and I especially talk about this when I'm talking about like the woman I wanna marry, right? I want her to be like this, like this, like this. And people tell me, Dylan, you're being so fussy. This, that, you're describing a unicorn, right? But I want to have high standards. I want to have high standards for the woman I'm gonna marry and the people in my life as well, right? And so when you find these people, it is truly a magical experience, right? When you are in a peace and they are also in a peace, right? It's such a valuable friendship to make, right? And eventually a partnership and a marriage to make when you find a woman who is like this as well, right? It's so wonderful to do, right? And here's a picture of like a, a meme of like friends. And it's, it's honestly something that makes me so happy when I find people like this, when I find people that think in a way that is similar to me like that's like kind of reached a level of maturity where i'm like able to like converse with them in a way that's like it's so smooth running through life i always feel joy and happiness and peace and love and i'm able to feel those feelings because this person has also done the work that i've done right it's like working hard to reach like the 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 nice place of life like the the level up like the and you can just interact with these people in such a great way it's honestly wonderful it's oh, i can't describe it it's so great this picture is like a, a a tip of the iceberg of what it might feel like to be with people like this it's such a a brilliant thing and the effect you have on others right it's wonderful like it's very attractive like the people that surround me and the things that they say right you're always smiling right i love your smile you're such a a pleasantly happy person to be around. It's it's wonderful, right? You're so easy to talk to, right? These things that people say, you want people to say this to you, right? You make me feel safe, right? When you're calm, when you're collected, when you're just a person that is at peace with themselves and stable, this is how people feel around you, 
right? It's super, super attractive to other people, right? Because in a world of chaos, in their minds, right? You live in the same world, but in their minds, the world is chaos, anxiety, stress, and turmoil. In that world, you are as solid as a rock, right? And so <laughs> this is a bit of a cheeky slide, right? Be honest. What's your first impression of me? Right? What do you think about me? Are you attracted to the way that I speak, like the way that I smile? How do you feel when I speak to you in this way? Right? I'll let you answer that for yourself and decide whether you're going to watch the rest of this video. But that's a question that I might cheekily ask, right? So how did I do it? How did I become this kind of, you know, discovered inner peace and enlightened myself like a monk? How did I do it, right? My name is Dylan Alexander and today I'm going to teach you what I learned over those 14 years, right? Teach you the lessons I learned in happiness, in mental strength and fortitude and being resili resilient in general and how to eliminate stress in your life, right? Whether that's even possible, right? In just one hour, hopefully, right? Not 14 years. I'm going to save you 14 years of time. You're not going to have to spend that time. I'm going to teach you everything that I know in about an hour's time, right? To save you that struggle and those scars in terms of learning those lessons in real life over time, I will save you that time, right? I'm going to teach you through our philosophy, right? In our philosophy, we don't want to be like sheep. We don't want to be like everybody else, right? Everyone. Because the thing is, if you want to be average, then sure, go ahead, follow everyone else. Be the average person, follow the average advice, right? And that's what results in you being the NPCs, right? Those people who are just who are like that, who are, who have no control of their anger, their anxiety, that live in a world of chaos, right? We don't want to be like them, right? And I've got in the corner a little kind of stat here. The average person is divorced, obese, and has less than 1K in the bank. That's not what we're aspiring towards, right? We don't want to be these NPC sheep characters, right? What's the alternative? We need to think outside the box here. Think about how we want to be in the world, how we want to interact with our, our own emotions and how we want to interact with other people and how our relationships and our dynamics and the way we see the world from our own brain results in how happy we feel in life. Right? So we want to be thinkers in life and not like these NPC sheep. And that's our philosophy that we're going to learn today through this process. So first, I'm going to take you through six steps in how to eliminate stress and anxiety in your life. And then we're going to go through a Q&A and we'll answer some questions that you guys have submitted below. So those, those questions are from a community of mine that I have in the first link in the description and the pinned comment below if you want to submit some questions there. More details about that later. So six steps. Some very intriguing titles here. Okay, The Locus of Control, Dogs on a Leash, Perspective, The Power of Now, The Fine Law, and Welcome to Heaven. Right. I've intentionally made these titles a bit intriguing for you to kind of like wonder what these are about. And don't worry, I'll break them all down. I'll tell you what exactly they mean. And we'll get through that in good time. So step one, the locus of control. No, it's not one of those kind of cricket creatures that go through and like terrorize like a plague of locuses that you might have heard in the Bible. It's locus, right? This is a mathematical term, right? It's Essentially, it means like a defined boundary, like around a point or a line or a square, whatever it is. It's a defined boundary. And the how it relates to the topic I'm talking about today is how we define the things that we can control and the things that we can't control. I like to imagine it as like an actual barrier around a person. Like maybe you've watched like TV shows and things like that where people have like force fields around them or something like that, right? And I like to imagine it like that. The stuff that I can control, like inside this bubble that I exist in, and stuff that I can't control. And a certain sense of inner peace comes from an understanding of where exactly that boundary is. Right? So there's two parts to this. Let me teach you this. Two concepts here, right? One is the knowledge, and one is the belief. Right? So let's break that down. The knowledge part, right? So let's say you're boarding a plane and you're terrified of flying, right? You've got your passport, you've been through the security and everything like that. Everything's done and you're looking out the window and you're like, oh my God, I'm so terrified. You're like in this weird pose. I got an image of this and I was like, oh my goodness, this guy's got his legs crossed twice. That's crazy, right? He must be very nervous, right? 
And so you're worrying and you're anxious about this and you're stressed out over it, but there's an alternative here. Instead, you can be at peace. This is the kind of thought you might go through. You might, th you might think the pilot, the weather, I can't control these factors, right? I know that there's nothing I can do there. So there's no point worrying, really. There might be turbulence, um, there might be different weather issues and things like that. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a fun ride. But the pilot will sort it out. Most planes, like, it's very, 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 very rare for a plane to crash. And in fact, it's more likely for you to, you know, die of a car crash than a plane crash, right? Way, way more likely, right? So that kind of knowledge you have in your brain about, okay, the weather, I can't control the weather. The pilot, I can't control the pilot. And it's much more safer than driving a car, right? If I, if I look at it in that way, then I can be at peace and relax. So you can be like this relaxed in the plane, put your eye mask on, recline your seat if you're on first class, and be relaxed, right? So there's a difference here between this very anxious personality and the relaxed personality. And the only difference is the understanding of the knowledge behind the scenario that you're in, right? This person can become this person, right? And that's something that can actually happen, right? If you're anxious and you begin to understand the fact that, okay, this, like millions and billions of people fly every year, right? It's safer than driving a car, right? And I can just relax because I know that other people are doing the work for me. There's nothing I can do to control the weather. There's nothing I can do to control the plane. Other people are in charge of that for me. So I can just sit back and relax. Enjoy the journey, right? I'm not the one driving here. It's okay, right? It's a mental state that you can come to understand and come to find a sense of peace within that journey. So there's a defined boundary between you and the outcome, right? You have nothing to do with the outcome, right? So you can relax in this area knowing what you're capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing and be relaxed, right? So the second part is the belief, right? There is a quote that I hear quite often that people say, or like a, a general kind of thing that people say. You might not hear these exact words, but something along these lines. It's not my fault. Nothing. There's nothing I can do about the situation. So why bother, right? This is where it becomes a problem, right? That's why there's a, there's a distinction between the knowledge and the belief in this chapter here, right? There is the character of this person, right? Who's like, Oh, woe is me. Isn't my life terrible? It's raining and I'm getting wet and how horrible is my life? Look at that. Look how awful my life is right now, right? Woe is me, right? Woe is me, right? How do you spell woe is me? Is it, is it just W-O or is it W-O-A-H? I don't know. But this guy is saying, woe is me, right? Isn't my life awful? But instead, we could be this character, right? He has agency in his life. He's like, you know what? It's raining. I don't care. I can get an umbrella, right? He takes personal responsibility over his own situation and says, I can control this, right? Despite the hard things going on, he knows what he can control and has this kind of sense of like, you know, responsibility, ownership, agency, right? What he says to himself is, I am in control of my own destiny, right? And that's such a powerful phrase you can say to yourself, when you're in an attitude that says, you know, woe is me, isn't this terrible? Isn't, aren't I going through a terrible time right now? You can say, no, I'm in control of my own destiny, right? So there's a difference here between the guy that's like miserable in his own situation versus the guy that takes responsibility and like, you know, gets an umbrella out. That's like the most basic example of what you can do here, but maybe you're in a situation that's a bit more complex. You can tell yourself, I can either sit here and be miserable and say, you know, woe is me and like talk about my problems or I can act upon the problem, right? There's that sense of ownership and clarity between what you can do and what you can't do. Right? So it all comes back to this locus of control. You can choose what you can control, right? It's a mentality between what you can't control and what you can control, right? So it's a, a two-pronged approach between the knowledge that you have and the belief of what you can control and what you can't control, right? 
two things to notice there. Agency, responsibility, ownership. That's what we talk about when we talk about the sense of belief in what we can control, right? And so if you can combine these factors, being relaxed about what you can and can't do and realizing and believing what you can do, that results in happiness. And that reminds me just now of this, this serenity, serenity prayer, right? It goes something like, God give me the courage to understand what I can and can't do and the, the power to believe in what I can do. I can't remember how exactly it goes, but it's, it's pretty much this, right? Being relaxed, knowing what you can and can't do and having the belief of what you believe that you can do, right? And that was what results in happiness in these scenarios, right? That's one key to happiness. Okay, let me teach you about something else as well. Chapter two, dogs on a leash. Okay, that's intriguing. What's this about? This one's about emotions. Okay, there's a big, mis there's a big misconception about emotions when it comes to the area of masculinity and stoicism, things like that. People tend to think that you must bottle down your emotions and never show your emotions because you're a man, right? Men shouldn't have emotions. Men should be stoic creatures and never have any emotions at all and they should never show them. It's a bit of a misconception and it leads to dangerous places, right? So yeah, the no emotion, the bottling it down especially, right? Just bottle it down, we'll take care of it another time, right? But it's still inside you, that tight ball of like un unraveled emotions, unprocessed emotions inside of you, right? Like in your stomach or in the back of your brain, constantly throbbing deep within you as this unresolved issue, right? Like a, like a ghost with unresolved, you know, stories that comes back to haunt you all the time, right? And we are taught, we are told sometimes by people that we shouldn't have emotions, we shouldn't show them. Sometimes people relate stoicism to like the image of a, a highland cow in a field with the the paint dripping, sorry, the rain dripping off of its fur and just it just stands there because it's a cow and it doesn't care about things and it's so cool and it might even seem cool to be this kind of stoic character, right? But I think that's a bit of a misconception and it relates to something similar but not quite the same, right? So let me teach you about this next bit, right? That is not how it goes. That's not, that's not how we achieve the levels of happiness that we need to to live a happy life, to discover inner peace, right? Instead, it's more about control, right? It's not about having no emotions at all. It's more about having control over the emotions that we do have, right? Control. And in that sense, emotions are like dogs, right? We have a certain amount of control over our dogs. And so our emotions can get out of hand as well. Our emotions can be like this, right? This, of course, our dogs are, are not in control, right? We can see that dogs are like barking and causing a nuisance to the people around them that don't like to like hear this loud noise in their faces all the time. Your dog might like poop in an area that might be like very impolite to other people and affect other people in bad ways. And people look around and stare at your dog and your dog might cause havoc in your home and like, bark at other people. And you, you might barely be able to control your dog, right? And the same way, our emotions are quite like that as well. You know some people at times that are barely able to control their emotions. Their emotions are in control more than they're in control, right? In the same way that some people, their dog is more in control than they're in control, right? And so even at times, it can be scary, right? When someone can, can't control their anger, their aggression, their violence, they can be scary. And this is similar to what I kind of felt when I was a kid, I looked up at the adults around me that had faces like this, right? That they couldn't control their emotions and they were like a monster to me, right? And that can still be the case when you're an adult, right? People can be monsters and really like destroy, come into your life and destroy your life. They can be very, very unpleasant people to be with or to be around in general, right? So these emotions of anger, aggression and violence without the control, right? These can be good things, right? These can be, in a scenario, these might be good things. But without the control, it's scary. It's, it's not something you want to be around. The guy with a short temper, that guy with a short fuse, that you know that if you do the slightest step out of action or out of place, you feel like you're walking in eggshells. They're going to explode, right? You can't be yourself around these people because 
they are that short-tempered. And you don't want to be around these people, right? It's not pleasant. It's not nice. So instead, what do we do instead, right? Instead, we can train our dogs, right? Dogs are trainable. They can be well-behaved. It can bring the lead to you. It can sit down when you tell it to sit down. It can do tricks for us even. And when we have a well-behaved dog, it's such a pleasant thing to be around. For you and for the people around you, when you have a well-trained dog, it's amazing. The people around you appreciate it as well. Your dog is so well-trained. That's amazing. Wow. Right? And I have a dog as well, a German Shepherd, and he is such a well-behaved dog. He just does exactly what I tell him most times. And he's, ador- look at him, he's adorable, right? <laughs> and even like when I'm, I don't even need to bring a lead with me when I'm walking him, right? He stays right by me. When you cross a road, I tell him, wait, right? He goes between my legs, he waits. I say, okay, you can go across the road, right? And he crosses the road, right? And it's such a pleasant experience to be with a dog like that. And imagine just for a second that your emotions are just the same, right? Imagine your emotions are like that well-trained dog on a leash, right? It ends up being such a spectacular experience for you to experience and for the people around you, right? And emotions can be trained. That's also part of the belief that I talked about in the first chapter, right? It's a belief, remember, right? The things that we can control and the things that we can't control. Some people believe that they can't control their emotions. Oh, that's nothing I can work on. What are you talking about? Control your emotions. I can't control my emotions. Well, that's your belief. That's your belief, right? If you choose to believe that you can control your emotions, this is something that is trainable within you. It's a skill that you can learn. I'm telling you right now. I used to be someone who was very highly strung and I got angry very quickly. I was very triggerable and the people around me knew that, right? And I mustn't, I... I mustn't have been a person that was pleasant to be around, be around, right? And I look back to my past and I'm thinking, damn, I was like that. It's kind of shocking to me at this point in my life that I was that kind of person. That might have been, you know, scary to be around. I know I was a, I was a kid, right? But still, it still counts, right? And it's hard at the start. I get that, right? You might have to implore or imply, so what am I saying here no, I've forgotten the word you might have to kind of uh, use these tactics right count to 10 you might just step outside of the situation like some situations are like just too intense for you to be like oh, I just can't deal with this right now I'm gonna step outside and take a breath really quickly right and just breathe right and these tactics work right don't feel like you're being childish for having to imply these tactics or having to kind of use these tactics they're fine count to 10 in your head step outside, it's fine, you can say that, look, I'm just, I'm getting a bit of a headache, I'm just gonna step outside for some air, right? You can say that, that's completely fine. I know some people might think of themselves as like, oh, if I have to do do stuff like this, that means I'm like, maybe not mature enough, right? No, it's completely fine. If you're growing on this journey, there's progressions you you need to make. There's baby steps on the way to getting to a place where you're like, completely like monk mode enlightened, right? And I'm not saying that I'm that I'm there yet, but it's it steps along the way. I'm still growing as well. I'm still learning about these things as well, right? So, road rage is a classic example of this kind of behavior, right? You might get uh, like I drive quite a lot as well, and people might cut me off or like they've ob- like obviously done me something wrong, right? They've obviously you know done the wrong move and done me wrong in that scenario, but the way I react. I could react like a, oh my goodness, how dare they do that? How dare they cut me off like that? But what benefit would that give me? Like I'm thinking in my mind, if I get riled up, then it's only just going to raise my blood pressure and give me stress, give me anxiety. It's going to make me age faster. And what's he going to know anyway? I'm in my two-ton box of glass and metal and he's in his two-ton box of glass and metal. If I get angry, he's not even going to hear me. He, He might not even see me. Right? So what does my anger even achieve? Right? What does my anger even communicate to him? Nothing at all. And so I, in my mind, see no point in doing that. There's no point. Right? And how do I react instead? 
I'm like, ah, some people don't know how to drive. Silly drivers, right? Ah, I kind of shrug it off my shoulders. It's like a, a thing that happens, like a little, a funny thing, a funny story, right? It doesn't have to be that deep of a thing that goes on in your life, right? Emotions are not a bad thing. I want to emphasize that point here. They're not a bad thing. Even these so-called negative emotions of like anger, aggression, violence, things like this, they're not a bad thing, right? It's about control. It's more about control than it is about the fact that the emotions in themselves are bad or good, right? So a classic, classic example here, yes, even anger, violence, and aggression, because look at this, right? Let's say there's someone assaulting your mother or your wife or your sister or someone in your life that you really care about. They're doing something horrible to them, right? Are you just going to sit there idly by? Are you going to say, oh, oh, aggression's not a good thing. Violence isn't a good thing. Anger isn't a good thing. I'm just going to sit here like a sheep and be be a, a good a good boy. No. I, <laughs> that If I saw you doing that, I wouldn't have respect for you. Right? If you see this going on, the right response is aggression, violence, and anger, right? To solve that situation, to, to save the people you care about from being in the situation that they're in danger, right? And this is like the toxic masculinity narrative right now. It's crazy. Give me one second, I'm just going to drink some water. People say, that this kind of behavior is toxic masculinity, acting in aggression, acting in violence. But sometimes you need that. You don't want to be that soft NPC sheep. That's like, that is such pathetic behavior. Just to idly stand by as the people you care about are being harmed and hurt and being taken advantage of. Sometimes violence is the answer, right? You want to be like that Spartan spirit, right? That valiant, heroic nature. Masculinity is valiant. Masculinity is heroic. Masculinity is not toxic. Right? It's just a word that people have made up to like market this like softening of men around the world. Don't become part of that. Don't become part of these NPC sheeps that are following along with this narrative. Do not do that because it's not a good thing. I'm telling you right now, emotions are not bad. It is the control of them that we need to care about. Okay, so what does that mean, right? It means basically the conclusion here is train your dogs. It leads to a happy life for you and for others around you, right? Because when you go around to the park, you don't want your dog terrorizing everyone else. You don't want your dog just running off and barking at everyone and pooping everywhere and doing all these bad things. That's how it looks like when your emotions are in control. You are annoying to the people around you. You're an inconvenience, you're unpleasant to be around for the people around you, right? So ask yourself this question, right? Who's in control here? Who's in the driver's seat? Me or my emotions, right? Are you driving or are your emotions driving the situation that's going on here, right? Make sure that you are in control and that generally leads to a better life for you, right? So let's look at the next step. Step three, chapter three, perspective. Okay, you probably understand this one from the title, but let's have a look. This is a quote that I love a lot. This quote used to be on the background of my laptop for a long time. We suffer not from the events in our lives, but from our judgments about them. Epictetus, classic Stoic philosopher. And this is something that you might want to think about for a bit, right? Have a think about that. It's so like, <laughs> I've got on the next slide, Whoa, so deep, right? So have a think about that for a second. I'm just gonna drink some more water. My throat is really dry right now. It's really quite deep, isn't it? Right? What it basically means is that no matter what our suffering is, right? If you look at this slide right now, there are kids born with no legs, right? And sometimes even no arms. And look at the smiles on their faces, right? It's because of their perspective. But their perspective is they never had legs in the first place. They're like, why would they be sad, right? It's only like us adults who have the context of 
oh, having legs, not having legs and like being sad about it. That's an adult thing, right? We've kind of like adopted that sadness from the mentality of what it should be like. It should be sad. It should be stressful. It should be anxiety inducing. But these kids don't even know about that. So from their perspective, they're all smiles and cheery, right? And even kids on the street, these street kids, right? They're just like fascinated by the world around them. Like They're like, oh, look at this guy taking a picture of us, right? This brother is telling her little sister. And look at these kids, right? They're like showing the cameraman the, the food that they have. Look at us, we got food. And they're just like smiling and being happy about it. It's amazing, right? Just to like notice these kids on the street who are just happy. Right? Imagine yourself in that scenario. Imagine the average person today in the first world being transported to, the, to that kind of lifestyle, right? They'd just be stressed and, and anxious all the time. And the gratitude that these people have to even have like a deflated football to play with. That's like the best day in their lives, right? A deflated, dirty, old football. And to think about that versus the lives that we live today with such luxury, with such enjoyment and such pleasures, such kind of like all of our base needs are taken care of. Right? These kids don't even know where the next meal is coming from, yet they are happy. Right? Most people, even from the smallest thing, like a mosquito bite, get into this rage of like emotion and anger and anxiety and like, it's silly when you look at this or when you compare the two of these things, it's silly, right? Most people overreact. Most people are overreactors, right? So what can I do, right? Gratitude is one of my favorite things that I like to tell people about. And this is the practice of what gratitude means is basically a sense of thankfulness, right? I am thankful that I get to, you know, drink this lovely water right here, right? I'm thankful that I get this, you know, this camera and this microphone and this pen to draw with on the screen, right? I'm grateful for these things. And so when you're able to say that to yourself and actually believe in it in your mind, the world becomes a thing and a place full of things to be thankful for right? And you can, even even better is to kind of write down these things in full sentences. Like I used to have a habit of ju gratitude journaling, right? That's the classic self-improvement kind of way of doing it. That's the classic way. There's other ways as well, right? Going out to walks in nature, feeling the breeze in your skin and things like this, right? So the journaling ones typically, if you write down three things that you're grateful for every day, right? Just three things, right? that tends to develop a feeling of like happiness and thankfulness for the world around you, right? I used to have the habit for a long time, but I don't normally do that these days. I'll be honest about it, right? What I do are these other habits, right? Going for walks in nature, looking around me at the different shades of like green in the grass and the trees and the leaves and the flowers and things like that. Just looking at it and taking like a mental picture, right? A little click, like a click right? It sounds cheesy. It sounds kind of like, you know, what are you trying to do? It sounds all hippy dippy and like oh, nonsense, right? But going out into nature and feeling the wind in your arms and in your hair and doing things like this really affects your mental state. I've got a little phone here. Sometimes you might be able to text someone that you're thankful for them in, their, in your life, right? If you think about someone in your life, this is a hack that I've learned over, over time. If you think about something or someone, text them, right? Like I, or I saw this picture of a, a model in the, in the advertising on, on the side of a bus, right? And it reminded me of you. So you take a picture and send it to them, right? And it gives that kind of, not just for you, but for them as well. Like, oh, this, this person's thinking about me. Isn't that so nice, right? And that for you brings you joy because you're giving something to someone else. You're thanking them for being in your life or whatever. You might even just send like a text saying, you know what, mate, I've been thinking about you today. I'm just so thankful that you're in my life today, right? It sounds, it's, I know it sounds very cheesy and very like emotional and lovey-dovey and things like that, but it's just something that you can do, something small that you can do to make your life better, right? Make your life seem better 
and therefore make your life actually better. Because what these emotions are, what happiness is, isn't entirely objective. It's subjective. It's based on perspective, as we've been talking about here, right? And even things like, you know, grabbing someone that you love and just like, you know, giving them a kiss or giving them a hug or even just patting them on the head, right? Like I, a lot recently when I've been at home with my dog, I just walk past him and I just pat him on the head. Just to say, you know what? I'm glad you're around. I'm glad you're like in my life as a dog, right? You might grab your, your wife or your husband or someone that you care about and just, you know, give him a, a punch on the shoulder or like a little pat on the head or a pat on the back, right? Just to have that kind of like, that sense of a bond between you and a sense of gratitude of them being in your life, right? If that makes sense. And it really, really helps. It really, it doesn't seem to help in the moment, maybe like when you do it once or twice, but it accumulates over time. If you keep this as a habit that you have every single day, it really makes your life something that is, you, you look forward to waking up every day and thinking, what a world that I live in. How grateful I am to live in a world that is as beautiful as this, with the people I love, with the nature that I love, with the, you know, these, a phone full of contacts that you love, with your text messages and things like that. And if you fill in a journal, a journal full of things that you love and care about and you're thankful for, right? Isn't the world so wonderful? Just as I said just now, right? That's the kind of attitude you want to bring to your environment, right? And here's a quote I love from the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? At the end of the movie, he says, life moves pretty fast, right? So you've got to stop and just take a look around once in a while and smell the roses, right? Because you could miss it, right? And this is the way that I reacted when I heard that quote. I was like, oh my goodness, that is so true. A lot of people I know in my life just work with their head down or like they just get on with their life with their head down and they don't take a moment to look up and think hmm this is my life right now right they just keep going right so 10 years later when they're through that tunnel and they finally look up they're like where did the time go right and so oh oh wait (laughs) i kind of skipped a slide there but where did the time go right they ask themselves that question it's because they haven't looked around Right, and so I'll, I'll go back a slide and look at this, right? I will intentionally go out of my way to do the scenic route in the day, right? So that means things like, you know, going out of my way to go on a walk or going out of my way to, even like driving to the gym, I'll pick the scenic route just so I can like, you know, zone out of myself and think, this is the moment that I'm living in. The scenic route, which like, I can see all the fields and the trees driving down the hill and it's, amazing and beautiful and it's a little mental picture for me right i can just literally just take a moment to like look at the fields and the trees and click it saves in my brain and it kind of like it's a moment for me to savor the moment that i'm in truly and for what it is right and it's a very very powerful technique for you to kind of derive happiness from the life that you're already living not from what tomorrow might hold, not, not from what the future might hold, but from the life that you're already living, if that makes sense. So, where did the time go, right? The classic example of this person working at a desk and, you know, 10 years might go by and he doesn't even know where those 10 years went. And that is just a very sad story that I don't want anyone to repeat, right? It brings a tear to my eye to think about people like that. Genuinely, it's sad. It's not where you want to be. And it's, it's an attitude. It's not a result of what you do in life. It's an attitude. Are you going to be happy or are you going to be sad? It's, it's almost a choice you can make, right? So look around you. Yes, right now, wherever you're sitting, imagine if, even if you're in your home in your bed, watching this on a phone screen or your laptop screen, it doesn't matter. Look around you in this moment right? And take it in. Because this moment will last only for this moment. It will go, it will pass by. You might think, oh, it's going to be the same in, you know, a couple of years time, it's going to be the same. But the thing is, you might want to record that. 
You might want to think about what this life is right now, right? I even did this about a year ago when I recorded like things around my room. Like I record videos every day, right? But I record like a, like a kind of time capsule, like a hello, hello me in one year, that kind of video, right? And so I kind of like, I did a tour of my room, looked around my room like this. And I'm so glad I did that because right now my room is entirely different. And I was like, oh my God, I remember when my bed was in that location. I remember when my calendar was over there. I remember reading that book in my life. I remember, you know, having that toothbrush or this water bottle or this camera setup or whatever. I remember that. And that's always a pleasant thing to look back on, right? I remember that situation, even if it wasn't particularly pleasant at the moment of time. Looking back in itself is a pleasant memory, right? I remember how awful my life was. Even that is a pleasant thing. Even that can bring a smile to your face, right? So take that mental picture. Click, like genuinely actually do that right now. Actually look around you, right? Click. So there's a the memory for you. My gift from me to you is this memory right now, right? So remember this, remember this moment in time. And now the fourth step. I'm going to take some drink of water before we continue. Okay. The power of now. What does that even mean? This one is about meditation. But what even is meditation, right? I know that when I talk about meditation, a lot of people are like, what does that even mean? So let's define some terms here. Meditation essentially from what I understand and through my years of experience with this kind of thing, is essentially being with yourself in the here and now, right? You're not thinking about the past. You're not thinking about the future. You're being with yourself here and now. And so traditionally, that might look like this. You might imagine in your mind someone like sitting cross-legged with their palms face up on their, on their knees and they're kind of closing their eyes and, oh, that kind of thing, right? You might see in movies and things like this and religious places as well. And while that is the traditional method, right? And you can do that. Absolutely. It's great to do. I've done that many times in my life, right? It's not something I do anymore because I found like alternatives to it, but I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, this is actually a great thing to do. Right? I'm not going to like make any, like, how do I say this? I'm not going to say it's a bad thing basically. Right. There's other methods you can use, right? Methods that I use on a daily basis are things like walks in nature, right? Without your phone, by the way, all of these things without your phone, because your phone is a distraction that takes you away from the present moment, right? Meditation is a practice of being in the present moment. Your phone takes you away from that, being with yourself, being with your, your, with you and you alone in the here and now. So going for walks without your phone, going to the toilet without your phone. I know embarrassing to admit, but most of you guys bring your phones to the toilet, right? Driving, right? Without any music, having that time to kind of think with yourself. And you might think driving without music, are you a psychopath? What are you, are you crazy? Right? But think to the times when you had showers without music. Think about the idea of shower thoughts. Where do they come from? Usually in an average person's life, a shower is the only time that their brain gets to just relax and be by itself. And so these deep thoughts that come up in your brain are a result of this meditative state that you're in with no music and no phone, no distractions to distract you, just you and yourself. There's nothing to look at. There's nothing to like hear or see. It's just you. You're in the shower. There's just water coming down. You're, just, you're not particularly doing anything, right? It's just you in that moment. And to think how powerful that is, you can translate that to other things. Drive, right? Most people can drive like, you know, subconsciously, right? Like my hands can do the controlling and I can think about something in my mind at the same time as driving, right? Sometimes I like to just lie down on the grass or something like that and just let my mind be in the here and now, you know, feel the emotions that I'm feeling and feel the physical sensations that I'm feeling, right? So here are some other methods, right? I'm not trying to diss like traditional meditation, but there are other ways that you can access that kind of realm of thinking, right? So yeah, shower thoughts is a way for you to enter a meditative state. 
That's the kind of point I'm making here. And it's a really good way of untying mental knots, if you get what I mean there. Mental knots means like things that you're kind of thinking through and you're like, you can't quite get a conclusion to what this problem might be. You can't quite find a solution or maybe you're just like, you're stuck somewhere and you're like, oh, I just, I don't want to think about this anymore. You can just relax a little bit through this meditative state and it unties that mental knot. It releases things in a natural kind of way. I can't quite explain how it does it, but it just has that power, right? The power of now. Journaling is a great way to do this, right? I talked about gratitude journaling before, but journaling in my life is something that I still do to, to, I still do to this day, right? Normally not on a piece of paper anymore. I have a journal, uh, I had a journal, like maybe two or three journals that I filled out and I kind of wrote on a pen and paper, but I like typing now with my journal, right? And the attitude that I have to it is that I can get a thought out of my mind and onto a piece of paper or onto a screen if I'm typing, right? So many times in my life, I've been anxious or stressed or something comes up, right? Because like these emotions are natural, right? They come up, right? And I'm like, I feel like a little bit of a twinge of like, mm, what am I thinking here? Like this is kind of like a, even if I don't know what the emotion is, I feel like a slight bit of discomfort about something that's going on, right? I type it out. I'm like, hmm, I feel a bit weird today. This is what's going on. And here's how I feel about it. But I'm going to, I'll probably solve the problem like this. It'll probably resolve itself in this way. And I'll do this and I'll do that. And by the time I finish writing that, it's like on the piece of paper so that I don't have to worry about it anymore. And that makes me feel a lot better. Right? It makes me feel like, oh, I can just get on with my day now that that thought is on a paper that I can come back to or even not even come back to. Right? Now that it's down somewhere, it's out of my mind, I can carry on with my day. Right? It's a very powerful way to get rid of those kind of stressful thoughts in your mind. And note to self as well, right? I often record like on my phone. If I'm in the car or something like that, I record to myself a note. If I can't type something out or write something out, I record a note to myself. Here's how I feel. Here's what's going on. And here's how I, you know, here's how I intend to go past that problem. Right? And so these practices can really help us in dealing with these situations in our life where we might feel a little bit under under the storm, right? So learn to sit back and just watch and not feel like you have to like, oh, I've got to do something. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. There's elements to meditation here. There's elements to kind of like being with yourself that help here. Like one is the being with yourself and the second is kind of being okay with your emotions and being okay with how you feel and being in touch with that through journaling and recording of yourself. But there's an element of being okay just to be there in a situation. Just feel the emotions you're feeling, the physical sensations you're feeling, listen to the sounds and the tastes that you're having right now. I like this little Michael Jackson like meme thing here, right? Like he's just kind of, he's just watching. He's, he's not like dependent on the outcome of the situation. He's just there like sunbathing on a bed, just relaxing. No intention to do anything. And that's why so many people love sunbathing. Some people think, oh, they're just being lazy. They're not doing anything. It's actually a very spiritual connection you can have with yourself doing nothing. When do we ever intentionally do nothing in the day? It's quite rare, isn't it? And so implementing that practice in our day is such a powerful habit that contributes a lot to our overall level of well-being in life. And this is how I grow, right? Once I find that peace, I'm able to have that area of solitude where I can reflect, I have a period of reflection. Solitude, reflection, internalizing. I kind of go through these processes in my life over and over again. Through periods of time where I'm thinking about something deep, something that matters to me a lot. And I can grow through these periods of time, right? Reflecting on something, internalizing a lesson that I've learned about something in life, kind of looking at what the, the big picture is, right? And that time for me is a, a huge decompressor. I can relax and be with 
myself in that moment and know for a fact that it's going to make me feel better in the end as well that's part of the process right and here's a quote from Blaise Pascal it's beautiful in its simplicity all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone Blaise Pascal it's a powerful quote right it is often because we can't sit still that we are constantly ruminating about the stresses in our lives and we are constantly feeling like our lives are never at peace and it's strange that we wonder oh why is my life never never slowing down we never take the effort to slow down in ourselves or to stop or to pause right just like ferris bueller told us right there are some common mistakes we can make in this practice. Living in the past, right? Like I said, it's about being in the here and now. There's a story that I have to tell about like a husband and a wife. So in the morning, this couple have a, a bit of an argument. They get like, you know, angry at each other. They have a bit of a fight. And the husband drives to work and he's constantly thinking about this. Like, how dare she talk to me like that? How, like, how unfairly I'm being treated? This is bad. This is awful. And he's constantly running that tape in his mind again and again about what, what happened and what he's going to say back to her when he get, gets back home. And he lives in that cycle again and again. But he gets to work and his boss is like, okay, let's get to work now. And he kind of forgets all about it. He's like, okay, let's get to work. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do my work for now. And, you know, maybe think about that later. Right? So he does his work and he forgets about it. And it's funny, his mind is actually at peace now that he's doing work. Right. But now, lunchtime comes around. And suddenly, what does he decide to think about? The replay of the argument again. Right. He decides in that moment to be sad, to be like angry, to be like ruminating about that negative thing in his brain. And he's choosing to be like that. And then it comes to home time and he's like driving home thinking like, oh, I'm going to say all these things to her. I'm going to, I've been ruminating about this all day. And he comes back in the door and his wife is smiling at him, right? Oh, hello. How are you doing? Right? Turns out his wife has not even thought about it at all. His wife didn't even think they were fighting, right? So there's a difference completely in the energy that the wife brings and the husband brings. Because the wife didn't choose to think about that didn't have the perspective of a negative event like this husband did. This husband that dwelled in the past. And this happens to people for years and for decades. They hold a grudge against someone for years and decades and it's awful. The kind of stories that you can hear about events like this. It's horrendous. It's really bad, right? To live in that past and like, to voluntarily have this ball and chain at your ankle that you drag around with you. Imagine that, right? The second lesson here is that more stuff equals more stress. The more stuff you have, the less kind of lightly you can move around in the world and the, the harder it is to get to that meditative state, right? Because the more stuff you have, the more stress you have in your life with the fancy cars, the new phone, the this fancy chair, the big house, like the, the jewelry you have. Imagine having to care about all these things, right? The insurance and the car, like all the tires and the repairs and the, the grounds maintenance and the, the gardeners that you need to have to take care of the, the, the big land you have and the, the cleaners that have to come into your house and, you know, wash your clothes and clean the rooms and things and clean the chandeliers. And it's so much stress, all of these things, right? It's like a ball of chain around your ankle, right? All of this stress that you don't need, right? And I love this quote from the Fight Club, right? Where Brad Pitt's character says, the things you own end up owning you. And that took a while for me to understand at first, but it basically means that if you own so many things and you have to take care of them, then who owns who? Right? It's crazy, isn't it? All this stuff going on in the background, it's difficult to find that peace, right? With all this kind of like 
material possessions. I hate to be like a, I don't want to sound like a hippy dippy character talking about peace and love and like getting rid of material possessions. So with all that stuff going on, it's difficult to find peace in your life. Okay. So what do we do? Right. Basically, the summary here is less stuff and less screens. Right. The less stuff we have in life, the more minimal we can live and the more peaceful we can live. And that's usually better for us. The less screens in our lives, the less distraction we can live or have in our lives, and the more that we can live in the present moment for ourselves. And the more time we have to spend with ourselves, right? So, some bonus advice, some practical bits of advice you can have here to kind of just live more in the moment because it's difficult, right? It's kind of hard to kind of know what to do here, but I want to give you some bonuses here just as a little bit of extra to help you out in this area, right? The first is animals, right? I have a dog that I own. And it's very, very helpful for me to boost my mood, right? I often go downstairs just because I want to like, you know, interact with somebody and often it's my dog, right? I just pat him, hug him, and it just makes me feel better in the day. Take him for walks and things like that. I often go for walks where there's horses in the fields. And these are lovely, gentle giants of creatures that often curiously come up to you and sniff you out and they they can seem scary but it's actually such a pleasant experience when you can just be with them and just enjoy that moment right maybe geese and sheep are less friendly but it's pleasant to see in anyway right it's pleasant to see these animals in the fields and see nature and see the grass and the lake and things like that it's pleasant to see these animals right and people too sometimes right it might have to be like a very special person in your life that you might enjoy being around just, you know, giving a pat on the head and the pat on the back. Like I said before, with the gratitude thing, just them being around you or being around them brings you up in life. And sometimes these people are few and far between. And so, which is why I mentioned animals before I mentioned people, because strangely enough, animals bring out that positive response more than people sometimes or more often than people sometimes, right? The next tip is greenery, right? This is a picture of me uh, with a group of friends in Wales. We're hiking through this area and this picture just makes me smile. It's this huge, like there's green fields in the background, there's like, these ferns in the corner, there's these trees, all kinds of shades of green. And scientific studies have shown us that the color green makes us feel better. And you know that in yourself, right? You know that seeing trees or even having fake plants in your environment, right? Like this picture here, right? It makes me smile, not because like my dog looks so good, but also because of the greenery, right? Not just because he looks good, because of the greenery as well, right? Even fake plants that we have, right? Why do we have fake plants? Because of the fact that we enjoy greenery in our environment, right? There's been studies to show, that's why people buy fake plants, because studies show that it genuinely makes us happier. And if, if a hack is that easy to do, then why not do it? Why not go for walks? Why not have fake plants in your room? Why not have real plants in your room, right? The third thing is sunlight, right? Sunlight is something that inexplicably for us brings us joy. Feeling the heat on your skin, the sun in the sky, the blue skies. We get depressed when it rains and we get happy when it's sun, right? It's because of the effect it has on us, not just because of the vitamin D, although that's a very poignant fact, right? There's the vitamin D, there's the kind of the natural benefits of feeling sunlight in your skin, and that just generally makes us happier. The last one is sleep, right? Sleep is like the obvious one, that the boring kind of tip that everyone gives to say, you know, this is what you should do to be happy and to have a good mental health, but it matters, right? Going to sleep at the same time every day vaguely speaking, and waking up at the same time every day will result in a better mental state, right? People skip these like boring sounding tips because they think, oh, no, that doesn't matter. That doesn't sound like, you know, revolutionary enough to be something that is, you know, worth me doing, but it matters a lot. If you skip this, then it's just not, it's not going to be good for you, right? All this will help you find that peace, right? So step six, the fine law. I really like this one. 
Okay, let me just grab some more water. I'm really thirsty right now. This is a law that I found in the book Happy by Darren Brown. Right? You might know Happy, you might know, sorry, you might know Darren Brown as a magician, but he likes to write about philosophy as well, right? And this is a rule that I kind of, I had internalized in my mind, but I didn't really know how to articulate it. But this is a great way to articulate it, right? Darren Brown says on the cover, why more or less everything is absolutely fine. And that's the, the basis of this book. A very excellent book to read, by the way, if you want to check out something that's like very in-depth about this kind of topic as well, right? Let me tell you a story, right? This is a story that I'm going to label I Was Homeless, right? It's a story of basically when I was traveling to meet a couple of friends of mine and we were going to go from there to another place, right? So I was going to take a train back to my uni town to meet some friends and then from there travel to another location so we can have like a, a friend's trip kind of thing, right? So I planned this months beforehand. I like organized things and like called up friends and people I could stay with and things like that. So I called up people and organized this kind of stuff and it turns out like, okay, my friend wasn't gonna be there but her housemate was gonna be there. So I text that guy and said, okay, is this okay? I'm gonna come on this date. My train's at this time. I made sure everything was okay. Text him months beforehand and then weeks beforehand just to make doubly sure. And then like on that week, I text him as well. And you know, that was the plan. It was solid. It was good to go, right? So on the day, I get into a bit of trouble, right? I arrive exactly on time to that hometown and I have all my bags with me, right? All like four big bags and a huge rucksack on my back. I'm walking through town and it's like a quite a long way to this guy's house, right? And so I, you know, I'm just kind of doing things on the way through town, like buying bits of food and things like that because I don't want to go all the way back to town again. I might as well go from the train station to the town and then to his house because it's on like kind of a straight line, kind of like on the way to each other, right? So I'm doing that and then I decide, you know what, I'm just going to check my phone really quickly and text him and say, I'm on my way, I'm very close to the house, right? So I check my phone. I get like a bunch of missed calls, like 12 missed calls, right? I'm like, hmm, what's going on, right? I've got some messages and I'm like, okay, I'll check those later. I'll just call him, right? I call him and he's like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Dylan. I'm like, what? What's going on, right? I'm sat on this park bench with all my bags with me, all my things. He's like, I'm not actually in town. I'm really sorry. I, I, missed, I misread the day. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. And I tell him, you know what, look, I'll, I'll figure something out, all right? Don't worry about it. I'll figure something out, okay? And I hang up the phone. I'm thinking, oh dear, this is what I'm thinking right now. The plan was arrive at the town and have a night to sleep at, the, at the, my friend's place and then travel to a location. But that was kind of ruined for me, right? I couldn't do that anymore. How would you feel in that scenario? Just try and put yourself in my shoes there and think, what would you do? You're pretty much homeless. You, you, you're screwed, right? What do you do, right? I actually remained pretty calm. I actually kind of chuckled to myself, which like, I know that sounds kind of like weird to think about, but I was like, you know what? This is going to be a funny story when I'm going to tell this to my grandkids, when I'm going to tell this to the people I'm looking at, to the people I'm like going to grow up around. Right, I started looking around on like the the park benches I could be sleeping on. Right, I'm like, oh, fingers crossed it doesn't rain tonight. I could sleep on a park bench and it would be fine. Right, I remain pretty calm, kind of chuckling to myself and thinking, okay, I've got to find a way to like keep my bags with me so that no one steals my things while I'm sleeping or something like that. Kind of thinking it through logically like that way. Right, but thankfully. I called up a friend of mine, I, I sent a few texts to like group chats and things like that. Thankfully, someone offered me their sofa to sleep on for the night. And thankfully it was solved. But really, I would have been fine. Right? I would have slept on that park bench, it would have been a story to tell, and I would have been fine. I didn't rain that night at all. I'd have been completely fine. <laughs> and that to me is an attitude of like kind of 
how you look at a scenario. How do you look at an event and think, okay, this isn't that bad, right? It's that message that I talked about. Everything is absolutely fine, right? It's just dependent on how we react to a scenario. That's how, that's what determines how we feel about something, right? You control how you react. So if, if your attitude is like, I could absolutely have been very anxious. Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I could have been wandering around, like ruminating that idea of myself. But what good would that have done me? Right? The way that I react kind of controls my state of mind. So if I react calmly, then I would have been happy. And I was happy. I was fine. Right? And that rule of absolutely everything, or well, everything is absolutely fine, really stuck with me in that moment. Right? And it came to fruition. It came to be like something that was a cornerstone of how I live my life. A cornerstone of my attitude towards life. No matter how bad things get, it's probably going to be fine. Like even the worst, worst things in life, it's probably going to end up fine. Right? It's, it's not going to be the end of the world. Right? So with that being said, let's do the last chapter here. Welcome to heaven. Right? My throat is getting incredibly tired right now. I can't believe we've been talking for so long. So, let me ask you this. How do you get to heaven? You do good. Right? And they say, heaven is a place on earth. That's like a, a song about this kind of stuff. But what does that actually mean? Does that actually mean anything? What does that mean? Heaven is a place on earth, and it's in your heart. Right? I'll breeze through this very quickly, because I'm conscious of time. But... Heaven is a, a state of mind, in my opinion, right? When I talk about religion and I talk about Christianity, I like to talk about metaphors, right? I don't believe in heaven and hell as literal things, but I believe in them as metaphors, as states of mind. So heaven to me, in this context, is a state of mind where you have a clean conscience and a light heart, knowing that you've done the right thing every time, leaving no stone unturned, and having that peace within yourself in who you are, right? That to me is what heaven is. Right? And that metaphor of like, if you do good, you'll get to heaven. It's exactly true, metaphorically. Like if you do good, you'll be in a state of mind that is heaven-like, right? You'll be that light-hearted character, that clean conscience. You'll be able to go to sleep at night very easily, knowing that you've done the right thing, Right? That to me is what heaven is, right? How do you go to sleep at night? Like people ask that question. It's a, it's a phrase that people use to kind of guilt trip someone. Because if, you, if you're guilty, if you've done the bad thing, then you won't be able to sleep at night, right? Guilt is the hell on earth. Right? You often hear these stories of people going through like awful times because they know they've done the wrong thing. You know in your heart what the right thing and the wrong thing is. And when you've done the wrong thing, you feel that guilt. You experience hell on earth, right? And it's a conscious decision, right? Like if you do something wrong and you didn't know it was wrong, then guilt is, doesn't happen, right? But if you knew it was wrong and you still did it, that's when you experience guilt, right? You know in your soul what is right and what is wrong, right? Right? So you know. And if you know, then you know what to do. It's as simple as that. Some examples include helping other people, giving compliments to people, littering, being impolite. We know whether, they think, whether these things are right or wrong. right? And it's to do with that certainty of who you are. Am I a good person or am I a bad person? right? With that certainty comes a great happiness and a lightness in your step. A skip in your step because you know you've done the best thing. You know you've done the absolute greatest good you can do in this scenario. Right? You've weighed up every time you make a decision and chosen the good path. So you know. 
you have a light heart and a clean conscience, and that is incredible for your happiness. You have no idea how much it is, right? There was a point in my life where I chose to act like this and actively chose to be this person, to be the person that does good every time. Not that I was like a, a devil before, but this conscious decision for me was like a life changer. I honestly felt like this is what life is meant to be. Right? This is why they talk about heaven and hell. This is what religions are about. Right? Okay, finally, the Q&A section. I'm going to take a bit of a break. I'm going to come back and I'm going to pause the recording. I'm going to take a break and come back. But these are very good questions, so bear with me. I'll come back in a second. Okay, I'm back. So, the Q&A. These are very, very good questions, by the way. I remember reading them, and they are very detailed and excellent and nuanced. And I have a lot to talk about with these, okay? So, by the way, submit your questions. How do you do that? I have a community page. I'm going to talk about this very briefly. It's free for a limited time, right? Once you get that free price, it's free for life. You get to lock in that price of $0 a month. Why does that matter? Because it's going to go up to $129 a month, okay? So go check now. If it's free, grab that now. I implore you to grab it right now because it won't be free forever. It will go up. Save that price of $0 a month. You will never have to pay for it for the rest of your life, okay? So that's the first link in the description and the pinned comment below. Okay, cool. So once you get there, just click join group on the page. It looks like this. And you should be able to get in. Awesome. And I have some bonus content as well. So beyond this lecture by itself, I have some other courses that you can have. So I've got the carnival diet course, gym course. And particularly with this one, I'm going to have a whole course dedicated to mental health practices. Right. So if you want more than what I've talked about here, then go check that out as well. It's coming soon. So I'll be building that ac across time. And you'll see me build that and you'll get access to that when it comes out as well for free alongside that course, alongside that community page as well. Cool. So if you've enjoyed this so far, go ahead and click that and you will enjoy that too. But more about that later. Okay, Q&A. Very good questions. Number one. So for emotional control, how do you regulate emotions from things that happen which are out of your control? For example, when I'm trying deep work, etc., and my parents barge in and distract me. It's not really anyone's fault, but I find myself irritated a lot because of it. Right? I very much understand this problem. Like, in fact, in this recording, you know what? I was going to cut that out, but I might just leave it in here, right? Just communicate the idea to them, right? Just to communicate the fact that you're busy doing some work and you'd rather not be disturbed and you'd rather you know, have that security in the fact that you can do your work and not be interrupted, right? Communicate that first of all, right? But as you can see, it doesn't always work. I do still get interrupted, right? So beyond that, you've, you've just got to kind of shrug it off. You've got to be like, ah, uh, oh well, silly mum. Silly mum for interrupting my deep work when I'm studying and silly, you know, it's just, it's just something that happens, right? So communicate the idea of like, you know, please respect my my work time. And also have the attitude of like, oh, silly mum. Oh, well, that's all right. Right. It's not like a like a. It doesn't have to be a deep thing in your mind. It doesn't have to be like a, a incredibly annoying thing. Like I used to get annoyed. I, I totally relate to you. The person who asked this question, like I used to be very annoyed at the, how my parents would like for example, barge into my room, right? Or do other things in my life, right? Have like a very nosy attitude to what my life is like, right? I'd get annoyed. But now I'm like, oh, silly mum, right? Just like in a road road incident, incident I talked about earlier, it's like, oh, silly drivers. These, these people don't have to drive. Oh, well, people are like that, right? It's like a happy-go-lucky way of living life and it benefits you, right? It's such... It's a game changer, right? In terms of how how you allow things on the external to affect your life, right? Those are my thoughts. Okay, big long question here. For finding inner peace and controlling your emotions, how do you deal with being stuck in a rut? I sometimes wake up in the morning with no motivation to do anything when I try to rationalize, and when I try to rationalize it in my mind, I need to do this work because of this, etc., my mind immediately springs back with, but why? 
there's no point. Like when I want to go work out, but why? Because I want to look good, but why? If I find myself without an answer, then I tend to be lazy and procrastinate on what I need to do. It's like this twisted sense of nihilism. Have you got any tips for regulating this part of my emotions and to stop it from happening? I tend to find that when I have a rock solid purpose for what I'm doing, this is basically non-existent. So what are your thoughts on this? Okay, very interesting question. I definitely feel like I relate to this and definitely in parts of my life before. So why is a good question to ask, right? If you have like a solid answer to that question, right? a solid answer to why you're doing the things you're doing, then it helps you be able to justify your actions in terms of like motivation towards going to do that thing. So in the gym or waking up on time, right? I wake up because this. I go to the gym because this, right? Right. So having that solid why, as you mentioned in your question, when I have a rock solid purpose, then that helps a lot, right? Secondly, I'm going to share this quote from Friedrich Nietzsche. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how, right? So the why is much more important than the how, right? Which is great, right? This is pretty much why I mentioned in the previous bit and what you mentioned in your question as well when you said rock solid purpose, right? So the bit after this, there's also a an element of energy levels and your physical health and your diet and the level of sunlight that you're getting that might affect your energy levels and how you feel towards something physically, right? So that might be part of the equation. The amount of sleep you're getting, your diet, the sunlight you're getting, things like this, right? But still, I have to say, there are still off days, right? There will be days where you just feel less motivated and that's completely fine. But the solution is there, is to ask yourself or tell yourself now, not how. This is a, a quote that I got from Noah Kagan, the author of, what's his book? Million Dollar Weekend or something like that, right? Amazing quote from this guy, right? Now, not how. If you're ruminating on like, oh, how am I going to do this? Or why, right? Why am I going to do this? Just know it's good for me. I'm just going to do it. I know it's good for me. I've done it in the past. It's it produced good results. Just do it, right? When you're sitting there, it's five o'clock and you know you're supposed to go to the gym. You're like, oh, but I did leg day that day. I did chest day that day. Stop thinking, just go. Think less, do more, right? Now, not how, or now, not why. I guess that doesn't have much of a ring to it. Now, not how is what I remember, or why, right? So just do the thing instead of thinking about it too much, and you'll just get over that rut, right? Sometimes it feels like a rut, but you just gotta do it anyway, and just, it unravels itself. The rut unravels itself, right? It's like benching at the gym, right? Sometimes you hit plateaus where you don't bench. Your bench hasn't PR'd in a long time. But then you hit that new PR. And you get on like a new kind of a, a new, what do you call this? A new PR train or whatever it's called. I can't consider a word I'm trying to remember right now, but it's not coming to mind. Now, not how. Just do the thing without thinking too much, right? Next question. Slightly irrelevant side note. Have you got any tips for finding more of a purpose in the things you do? Long question, haha, but thank you Dylan for everything you're doing. You are welcome, I appreciate it. So, do something. To find a purpose, I feel like people zip from thing to thing and like, like they think, okay, I could do this, I could do that, I could do that. I don't know what I can do for my purpose, for my dream. Do something, do one thing that you like to do. Go hard and find out. Right, there will be times when you're like very invested into one thing and then you find out that it isn't quite your passion it isn't quite what you want to do and that's okay now you know now you know what you don't want to do like people go through years of university just to discover what they don't want to do sometimes very very common experience right now i know i don't want to do graphic design now i know i don't want to do geography or psychology whatever right now i know i don't want to do that okay so do something go hard and find out it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. Now, not how, as I said before, right? Always remember why you do something. Even when you get into it. Why am I doing this again? Oh, it's to help these people. Right? I want to help as many people as I can in the world. And that's why I'm making these videos. Right? Next question. Do you believe that it's possible to eliminate stress and anxiety altogether? 
or do you think it is just something we have to learn to live with? Certainly, I think that stress and anxiety are emotions that come with the human experience, right? That means you're human, basically, right? How would you suggest, how would you suggest we cope with external stresses at extreme levels? Okay, interesting question. Human emotions, yes, exactly the point I made just there. Stress and anxiety are, they're basically proof that you're human, right? If you're not, if you don't feel those things, that, then you might be a bit of a psychopath, right? And it's a skill you can learn, right? These kind of dealing with external stresses and having all the things that I mentioned in this lecture, the perspective, the kind of, the way you react to it, like telling yourself it's fine. These are things that are a skill that you can learn. Emotional kind of intelligence or emotional control or whatever you want to call this thing that I have talked about, the inner peace, right? All of these things are a skill that you can learn. You can get better at it over time and you will feel better as you go along, right? The, the dividends are happiness, literally, right? Your subjective feeling of happiness in the world is boosted the more that you learn this skill. It's so, so worth it. So please go out there and implement these ideas in your life today. Next question. Do you believe that it is possible to eliminate stress? Oh, is this the same question again? Whoops. <laughs> oh, okay, the second part of the question. So the second part, how would you suggest we cope with external stressors or extreme levels? Oh, sorry, I need more water. Sorry, I'm a human being, I need water. I've been talking for an hour and a half straight. Become anti-fragile, right? No matter how big the problem is, you can become more resilient. You can become, you know, stronger to that situation. If you're fragile and you break down at every little thing that happens in life, then how effective do you think you would be? How effective do you think you'd be at being happy, being calm, being stoic, being in control, especially as men, right? We need these kind of emotions. No matter how big the event is, we need to be stronger than the event, right? We can always say, oh, it's a matter of perspective. It's not the end of the world. It's all fine in the end. I'm so grateful for this. No matter how bad the things are, we can build that skill. And no matter how big it is, we can be stronger than that event. And believe in yourself in that way. Truly believe in yourself and you'll get very far with this. Insignificance, right? None of this will matter in a thousand years. For me, this is an argument that helps other people. But for me, I don't like this argument. I don't think it's, it helps me personally, but for some people, knowing that their problems will become insignificant in the long term helps them to realize that, that, you know, oh, this is just a small problem. In the grand scheme of things, this doesn't matter at all, right? For me, I'm like, okay, but what, like, how, how does that change how I feel, right? So for me, I, I don't like this, but for a lot of people, they really get a lot of happiness out of this. They're like, ah, oh, okay, that makes me feel better. It's up to you. If it makes you feel better, you can use that. But for me, it doesn't do much, right? For me, I like this, right? No matter what horrible, awful event happens, I'm like, isn't that an exciting story? Isn't that something I can tell my grandkids? Isn't that something that I can, you know, have as like my hero arc, right? In, in good movies, the hero goes through a tough time and then comes back up, right? That's how it works. And so I'm like, oh, this is like the, the tough part of my, my movie, my story, the story I can tell people, right? And so when I'm going through tough times, I secretly have a smile on my face. Right? I can sneakily be happy even though I'm supposed to be going through a tough time. I'm supposed to be stressed. I'm supposed to be anxious. And that's another thing, right? Why do we have to go along with what we're supposed to be feeling, right? It's almost as if people want to be sad. Why? <laughs> I don't get it, right? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, next question here. Slightly off topic. However, something that can often that often comes up and goes in my life is a feeling of emptiness and a lack of satisfaction in the things that I do on a daily basis. When I finally achieve my goals, I have set to myself and I'm often I am often left malcontent and restless. Fancy words, nice. Um, what strategies do you use to maintain perspective of your life and appreciative and appreciative of the things and people you 
have around you. Okay, very interesting question. I like this a lot. I definitely feel at periods of time that we have off days, right? I have off days all the time and it just feels like, oh, well, I just feel a bit weird, like mentally, right? So for the goals that you achieve, the emptiness you might feel after like achieving a big goal, I like to have mini goals. So along the way, I have little like checkpoints I can check off, like little flags that I can like multiply my happiness. Instead of like the, the one big goal, I can have little ones. Yay, 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 right? Instead of like kind of like hammering down and trying to like struggle through the process and then finally having the big yay, I can have mini yays, right? And the big yay, right? So if I have all of those and mini goals to look forward to that, then I can celebrate more times and have that happiness more times. And that tends to help me. Like maybe the last yay doesn't feel so great, but I had all these yays before. So who cares, right? I achieved my goal, right? It's fine, right? And the emptiness you feel might be for the fact that you don't have a, a goal to strive for beyond this, right? So when you have that goal achieved, have something planned for the future. What's the next checkpoint? What's the next kind of like iteration of this goal? Or what's the next thing I'm gonna be working on? Have something planned so that you don't feel like you're like, oh, what do I do now? Now that I've achieved that big goal, I don't know what to do anymore. Have a plan. Have a plan and have mini goals. That's my advice with that. Plan and mini goals. Cool. And gratitude, right? Absolutely recommend top tier habit, right? In your journal, in your life in general, write down a few thoughts of what you're grateful for. The people in your life, the things in your life, right? Your dog, your cat, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend, your wife, your girlfriend, like this camera, this microphone, this water that I get to drink because I'm so thirsty after talking for half an hour to for one and a half hours. My brain's not even working anymore. Whoa, I feel like my brain is fried today. But these things, the fact that my brain's working is something I can be grateful for, right? It's something that I can constantly come back to every single day, even if it's the same things. It's not as if like, oh, you can't be grateful for the same thing two days in a row. That's fine. You can be, right? You know in yourself what will make you happier and what will make you more grateful for the, thing, for the things around you, right? Write those things down and go and experience those things, right? If you're grateful for your father, go and tell him. Go and like hang out with him, have a beer with him or something like that. Show that appreciation, right? If you like nature, then go out for a walk in nature. Show that appreciation. And be amongst the things that you're thankful for. Right? Don't just be thankful for it and forget about it. Be in that mode of gratitude. And it generally makes you happier as an individual. Okay. Gratitude. That's done there. End of questions. Lovely questions. Thank you for submitting those. I appreciate that. And so the next part is... I forgot. I promise you the details. Okay. This is where I talk about the community page, right? So that community page I talked about earlier, free for a limited time, free for life, as I mentioned before. If you get it right now, you get it free for the rest of your life, zero dollars a month, you pay nothing at all because it will go up. So go and check right now because it will go up, okay? Link in the description, first one, and the pinned comment below as well. More info here, what's in there, what, it, what even is this? It's an exclusive community page, there's live calls, it's a high value network, one-to-one -one coaching and online courses, right? So as I mentioned below, this video includes all the details, right? If you wanna watch a, like a, a lengthier video to talk about all the things that are involved in there, the video talks about the details. And some bonus content I talked about before, right? The mental health one, especially, I'm working on that and it's gonna be incredible, a lot more information than even in this, right? I've been talking for an hour and a half, longer than that, and there's gonna be more like practical advice and really, you know, bite-sized lessons and a full like 10 hour course I'm planning on this topic itself, right? It's gonna be beautiful. So lock in your price right now and join this course to get free access, free access to this course and all the other courses that I have in this community. The link is in the description, okay? So thank you very much for watching. 
I hope that has helped you today. Genuinely, I hope that you can apply these lessons in your life. And genuinely, like, I promise you, you will have a happier life. And I'm so excited for you to feel those feelings as well. And for you to have a happier life. And to bring that joy to the people around you as well. So thanks for watching. And here's something that we say at the end of every single video. Knowledge is power. And the power is yours. Thanks for watching. Take care. See you in a bit.